Now we're going to look at the texts, which have in their own way a sort of spiritual sense. Huh? During this, the hot summer months, we, now we're in the Sundays after Pentecost, or the Sundays throughout the year, called ordinary time. No time is ordinary. I mean, ordinarius, ordinarium, you know. Uh, so, we go through a lot of the Old Testament. And, but in a way, because we're, we're taking our guidance from the Gospel. During this time, in this cycle B, we talk about the Eucharist a lot. That's the bread, that's the manna in our desert now, before we see the Lord. And it's hot, and, uh, you know, people who go to work are getting tired of going to work, and, you know, so it's a time when the church wants us to think of the manna in the desert, who is Christ, who feeds us. And so we have these illustrations. Today, we have this reading from uh, uh, the book of Kings. Huh? Elijah had been confronting, as God told him to, the kingdom of the north. And um, dear old Jezebel uh, wanted to kill him. Get rid of him. She did that, you know. When, you remember when Ahaz wanted to buy the field from uh, Naboth? And uh, he said, I'll give you whatever you want. And he said, I can't. It's, you know, it belongs to my family. It's handed down, and that's sacred in that culture. And so he went home and he pouted. He went to bed and turned his face to the wall. I mean, in a mood, over not much, you know. And his wife said, what, what's your problem? He said, Naboth won't say. She said, I'll take care of it. You remember that story? So she wrote a letter to the, the seniors of the town and said, take care of Naboth for me. So they accused him of speaking against God or against the temple, I forget which, and then they stoned him to death. Because the government said to do it. So she wrote a letter, they wrote a letter and she said, okay, you can have that field now. And so he's on his way there and Elijah stands there in the way and says, have you come to gain the fruit of the blood you spilt? He knows all about it. Well, then when Jezebel finds that out, she wants to kill him. She's got killing people in her head, you know. She's um, some, So anyway, uh, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life, going to Beersheba of Judah, which is quite a bit south. Usually, in the summer, Beersheba is five to eight degrees hotter than uh, up in Jerusalem, which is higher up, you see. So, he fled to Beersheba. He left his, and he going, he left his servants there and went a day's journey into the wilderness until he came to a solitary broom tree and he sat beneath it. And he said, Enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. I've had it. This being a prophet is a really tough job, and I don't want it anymore. Just, you know, take my life. So he lay down and fell asleep under the solitary broom tree. But suddenly an angel of the Lord touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a hearth cake and a jug of water. After he ate and drank, he lay down again. But the angel came a second time and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then strengthened by that food, he walked forty days and forty nights to the mountain of God, Horeb. You see, we were just talking about spiritual sense. You see how uh, this text is seeing a spiritual meaning to the manna in the desert. Elijah is getting his own form of manna many, many years later, 500 years, well, maybe not quite, maybe 300 years later. He's back out in the desert. 
and he's going. He's heading for uh, Sinai. He's heading for the. He, went, he goes to the cave and he and he meets Adonai there, and he's on his way there. And he says, "That's enough. Remember, I'm going to die right here. I don't want any more food. I don't want any more drink. I just want to die." And God sent the angel, said, "Eat and drink." And he went back to sleep. And the angel woke him up again and said, Eat and drink again. You have a long journey. Where? From where you are, through all the Lord wants to lead you through, to heaven. Now, that is a prefiguration of the Eucharist. The bread in the desert. Somebody wrote a book on the liturgy, on the, on the Eucharist, called Bread in the Wilderness. Because the manna, and now this manna the second time, if you will, see, prefigures our bread in the wilderness. We're wandering through the desert. And we need to be sustained by the bread. And so, Elijah's predicament, you see, is uh, a prefiguration, and he's given miraculous bread, huh? Because he walked 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of God, at Horeb, which is at Sinai. Forty days and forty nights, like the people walk forty forty years. So, can you see how this event of the Exodus is reflected in this event of Elijah? And he goes back to Horeb. And they came from Egypt to Horeb. And now, the next is going to be, we won't read it because it's, we're working on the Eucharist. But uh, can you see the same thing? Uh, this, I wonder if I hadn't gone through that, you probably would have gotten it yourself, wouldn't you? Elijah, out in the desert, tired, he gets food and water, goes to sleep, wakes up, gets more food and water, and in the power of that gift, walks 40 days to hoard it without needing any more nutrition. That's the new manna. And so the church takes that text to help us understand, you might have 40 more years to walk, but don't worry. You can be fed every day on the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, which is greater by far than anything that the Jews had in the manna or Elijah had in this bread. And therefore, the church takes this issue, uh, this event, and says, you see, you see, if you understand it there, in this lesser event, you can start to understand what the Lord does for you every time you receive communion. It's that sort of a reality, you see? You recognize it. It's like, and I've used this example before, see, the Old Testament is like a big prism. And the pure white light of the Gospel, Christ, is refracted through that prism and broken down into red, on yellow, blue, green, indigo, and violet. There we can see broken down well, it's hard for us to see as pure white light. But there are things yet promised in the New Testament that are not fulfilled yet, only in heaven. And that's where that famous text uh, comes in. Uh, it's in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10. The law, meaning the whole of the old dispensation, having the skia, the shadow or the sketch of the good things to come, but not the very icon. You see, it has a shadow of the good things to come, which is heaven, not the icon, which is the New Testament. Because in an icon, you have the realities, but not in a mode of existence that's proper to them. So we have all the goods of heaven, especially in the Eucharist. When we die and see the Lord, we're going to receive him, just like we do now. But then, not in icon, but the pragma, the reality itself. So there's three levels. There is the, the sketch, and then the icon, and then 
the reality. Uh, and so, that's what this uh, text is telling us, this text of um, Elijah. Now the psalm, and it's interesting that the, this psalm is used this week and next week both. Uh, it's Psalm 34. Uh, I will bless the Lord at all times. Huh? His praise shall always be in my mouth. In the Lord, my soul will glory, be proud, strut. The Lord. You see, I'm in the Lord and um, let the poor hear and be glad because if you understand what he did for me, you will take heart. That's the way Psalm 22 ends as well, right? The poor will hear about what you've done for me, you know, uh, I'm, I'm on, you know, I'm, you can, I can count all my bones, the lions are surrounding me, and yet, you heard me and delivered me, uh, and now, I'll tell the world what you did, and for future generations, will take heart. And so, we have the same thing in this psalm, see? So magnify the Lord with me uh, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. Doesn't that apply to Elijah? Yes, you see. I sought the Lord and he answered me, delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant and your faces may not blush for shame. Look to the Lord. And you won't blush for shame. Look to the Lord. And he will unravel all your conundrums. Look to the Lord. And he will give you confidence. Look to the Lord. You see? This poor one cried out. And the Lord heard. And from all his distress he saved him. Every one of us could say, Let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. And we do that to encourage one another. And that's the point of this psalm. And so, this psalm is meant to be a comment on the text of uh, the story of Elijah. Elijah was running away for his life. And he, he got all the way down to Beersheba. He's coming from the north, you know. So he has to go all the way through the southern kingdom. Now he's down in Beersheba. And... Uh, then he walked another day into the wilderness, into the desert. And he came to a solitary broom tree and he sat beneath it and said, Enough. Enough, Lord. Haddabas. It would say in Arabic, that's enough. Just kill me. That's enough. The Lord said, No, Elijah, you don't understand. I got plans for you. I got plans for you. So don't to give up. Don't say the Lord doesn't know where I am. He doesn't know what I'm doing. Just uh, do what I tell you. So the angel comes, feeds him. He gets relief. He sleeps. Then he wakes up. There's more food. He eats it. And then, in that food, he walks for 40 days. That's what this one is saying. That's why this psalm is used. You see, this poor one cried out, and the Lord heard, and from all his distress, he saved him. 